Welcome back to Fret Buzz the Podcast. Hello, my name is Aaron Sefcik, and every week together with my co-host Joe McMurray, we get into conversation with professionals all across the musical field. Whether that's talking about guitar, bass, drums, vocals, piano synth, we've talked about recording, mixing, and mastering, we've talked about music schools and job opportunities, we've covered a lot of ground in the past year. So with that, uh, we continue the good discussion on acoustic pickups, Uh, and later on Joe goes on a rant about Latin. So with that, by all means, let's jump into part two with Matt Thomas on Fret Buzz, the podcast. And you also use the the big spot for your kick sound. Right? I do, I do. Um, now Petri uh, uses a uh, a shot and dually um, right where he kicks, um, and it's a very oomphy sound. Um, and I, I tried several different ones. At one point, I was using a, a Demarzio Black Angel Paizo, but I found to be that what I liked cleanest. Um, I noticed that Petri, when he's using the Shat and Dooley, he's getting a little bit of hiss, and he was having to gate it, and you know, just transient noise problems. So uh, the big spot was just so quiet and simple. Um, and it was working at the time for me because I could get it directly from K&K with an RCA output. And he, I, I came up with this crazy idea that instead of having all these holes out of the back of the guitar, maybe having one big hole with six posts and each, each signal would have its own hot and cold that way so I wouldn't have any hiss or ground issues and connect everything on the inside using those RCA leads that K&K was using. So really I I kind of started using it because of the factors that it had but I I loved the the way it responded so much I kept with that big spot. So I used the big spot for the kick um, and Fishman came out with a new under saddle and mic combo. Uh, the matrix mic combo and man does it sound so good um really it reminds me very much of what the mate and pickup does um it, it's very similar in its feel so i get i still get the jollies <laughs> of past times in the feeling of the strings because of the fishman so go go fishman on that one uh good job on that and i i actually separated out um trs it comes on a trs wheel or output and i use the grace felix to separate the under saddle and the mic and you can get the most out of both of them that way um you can just really keep the beef of the under saddle without having a low cut the whole signal um and then rely on the mic for it to do what it needs to do. Uh, instead of putting a lot of bass on the internal microphone for your kick type stuff, you rely on that with the big spot. You know, that goes to its own channel and gets EQ'd like a kick drum. So the, you hit around the guitar, you wouldn't really want your your tappy tappy stuff to sound oomphy and woofy in the PA. So. The microphone does the the load of taking that end of the spectrum on. That's awesome. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's like that's that's it's just the idea of sonic placement. You right. you let you let each pickup do what it does best in the manner that you're trying to use it for. Now, you know, the K and K is just all it is is a, a, a transducing electrode. It's two pieces of metal together that when they have enough pressure, they put out a signal. So essentially, if you have it right underneath where you're hitting your palm, if you if you put a little extra bass behind it and just a little bit of gain, all that you're really going to hear is a thump out of it. Um, And I roll off all the highs and mids out of it at the touch mix and pretty much shelf it so that it's very narrow 
all that it's really listening or responding to is that frequency range. Um, and it, it does quite well for me. Um, now, it's not something that is really needed for a lot of the solo type stuff, but where I find it, it comes really in handy is when you get into group playing. Um, if you're playing with someone else and you're really trying to keep the integrity of all your sounds, you can really just, you get the response you need out of each different one. When you get into a band setting or a duo or trio setting, you're no longer fighting the band. Um, and that's something that if you watch Tommy playing with bands or other things, there is a battle. You know, the maiden does not like to play well with others. <laughs> so uh, fortunately, this new setup is something that I, I can jump in and play with a group and have an on off headroom to be louder than the band at times. Um, and that's fun. Um, taking the, the acoustic guitar and changing its power abilities. Um, it is now, it's, it's the forefront of the group where it's always been supplemental or just a side color. Oh, can we add some acoustic guitar on that? Just put it off into the left somewhere over there, you know? <laughs> and that's kind of, that's how they treated it for the longest time. And that's just not, not ever what I wanted for it, you know? Um, I like Don Ross's, uh, I think on Million Brazilian Civilians, he's got some tracks with uh, the full band that, like, but he's playing his normal stuff, but he's with the band. It's really cool sounding. Man, when he gets into the horn section stuff, I love that. <laughs> I, I I love I love the doubled horn lines with the melodies and stuff. It's it's just it's really clever. And as a matter of fact, if you enjoy that, Adrian Ballou also mm -hmm. has his own trio project. It is, I mean, it is it is rocking. It is it's a lot more metal driven than Don Ross's. Don Ross kind of has like this this groove jazz vibe. Yeah. About it. Whereas Adrian's is a it's a group of Berkeley musicians that are calculated. Everything that they do is in the pocket. It is it is it's cool. Uh, Cuz it I mean you almost just want to sit there and try to nap it. Cuz it, it's so awesome. So Big shout out to Adrian. Uh, that that dude's going places. Well, with going back to these pickups, take <laughs> take like our general listenership, probably not professional finger style guitarists, but definitely some players out there. You know, I mean, even for myself, like I'm starting to bring my acoustic out to shows, and I'll do mini acoustic sets. You know, every mm -hmm. you know, if I'm playing three sets, I might do you know, six acoustic songs or something, but it just doesn't sound good. And I, I've got my Taylor with its, it's a 2001 Taylor with the built-in Fishman under saddle pickup. What, like, where's the first place someone should start? Cause I, I don't think most people are going to go and get like three pickups and they don't know how to wire all of this stuff together. Like what's like the first well, thing you should do in order to get a pretty good sound for just your, you know, average person now if it, if it were just if you want to just plug and play pickup that kind of tries to do it all they're starting to become more of them um now the KK &K trinity is everybody's go-to um and it it does quite well with the percussive finger style stuff um not so much with sending effects but if you're just a singer songwriter and you just want to plug and play, uh, Dustin Furlow has a great, great response with it. Um, and it does quite well with just, just about every setting for songwriting. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with some percussive guitar as well. Um, now, my buddy, Travis Bowman, um, he has been working with a lot of Asian companies. And keep your ears and eyes open from that area of the world, because there's all kinds of new technology coming out at every minute. <laughs> it's, it's terrifying and awesome. Um, Cause I, I remember him telling me like three years ago about this crazy 
Bluetooth wireless guitar system that you literally just plug into your guitar and plug it into the PA wherever, and you could just walk around. And he was doing it at NAM, just like going around playing Hotel California, playing at other people's booths while it's playing at his booth, sort of thing. Um, and there's no latency. Wow. And it's Bluetooth. What? That doesn't make any sense. Um, and it's this company called Sky Sonic. Um, they make a lot of different types of pickups now. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're just diving down the, the route of we want to make everything and give you options of just about anything you want. And they got this really cool new um, triple pickup all in one. And it's you can install it yourself. You don't even have to have a luthier do it as long as you have an in-pin hole. But it's a magnetic sound hole pickup. And contact underneath the the saddle line, so it sits on the bridge plate like a K and K. Um, and it's also got a microphone built in to the magnetic pickup itself, so you can dial in all three of those tones on one output. Hmm. Or it's also got the option for TRS out, and it's got a little switch. So if you wanted to sit, um, preamp your mag and mic separately from your transducer, you can. It gives you the option. So that's it's a really cool route. You could get something s simple like that, and it would provide the ability to do multiple of these things without having to have three individual pickups. So there's there's becoming more and more companies giving the option of multi-sourced pickups. So you don't really have to go the route of putting a lot of them in. You can just rely on one that's already all together. Yeah. So, and, and really, um, if I had to, I'd just go with that Fishman mic combo. The, the Matrix mic does so well. Um, I, I went ahead and put it in my harp guitar as well. Um, it just sounds really natural. Um, I know, I think Al Petaway also uses it uh, and, and digs it. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's, that's why I even went down the, the Fishman Matrix route is Kim told me that uh, one of the best live sounds that she had ever heard was Al Petaway with his rain song live. And it had that, that darn Fishman in it. So uh, I tried it and I, Again, it, it feels and responds very much like uh, the Maiden pickup do, did. And so do, does. And so compared <laughs> to the compared to the K and K Trinity, like what's the difference between the Ma the Fishman Matrix mic combo and the K and K Trinity? There's an, an when you have a under saddle pickup, there's an initial response from the string that happens, whereas the K and K is much more like a microphone, whereas you hit the, the string and then you hear the note. Okay. Whereas an under saddle pickup, you hit the string and you immediately hear the attack. Not even the note, but you hear the attack of you hitting the string. And if you don't have it EQ'd properly, um, like if, if you have it wide open and you got a lot of bass pushed, through the PA, all you're going to hear out front is da 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 da. You'll hear the percussive attack of your pick, and not even the note. So there, there's that problem too. You know, um, if you don't EQ an under saddle properly, all you hear out front is thuds from your pick. That's what I kind of get when I play with mine. Like it's too. As soon as I use a actual flat pick, it's way too it, it, bright and the attacks see and it, well and that's that that's where you're, where the problem lies you know um i actually i don't like the upper end of of undersaddles so i actually roll all my highs off of the undersaddle mm -hmm. and the upper mids as well because it's got this this nasalness in the 800 range that i don't like so um I, I try to keep it more suited to relying on from about 60 hertz to 
maybe about 300. Um, but that's where it's best mm. is in that low and low mid range area. That's where it, it growls. It, it gives you that oomph and that power and drive behind your sound that Tommy, when he starts digging in with a stump pick, you feel it start to pick up and you go, okay, we're going somewhere now. And, and that's, that's what you want out of an undersaddle, but you don't get that out of a K and K. It doesn't provide the same sound unless you really have it beefed. And then you get into feedback problems. Um, and you decide, do I want to ride the feedback train or do I want to go a different route? Now, we, we look at Andy McKee. He has just made it. I, I don't want to deal with any of that. He, he does just the pure mini. He doesn't even do the Trinity anymore. He just does the, the pure mini into a detar, one signal. That's it. Cuts all the highs out, basically. Keeps it real bass heavy. And a lot of times has feedback problems. But he rides that. He rides that train. And he'll work with it on the stage. He'll find his zones where he knows he can and can't be. And he, he works with it with the music. Um, you know, you'll, you'll allow him, you'll watch him allow certain notes to bleed forward and then choke it out if he has to. Um, it just... It's an, it's also an entertainment thing. Is that how you want to perform as chasing and writing the sound or do you want to conduct it? And that's, that's something that I kind of made the decision. I want to be the conductor. I, I don't, I don't want it to drive me. I want to drive it. I want to have full control over every bit of the sound. So. Man, that's so much. <laughs> there's so much to this. They're, they're really it's it's overboard. so much harder than just just playing an acoustic guitar in your it, room. It, it is it, um, going going down. <laughs> made electric guitars, and that's why they have engineers and people that this is what they this is their whole job. You know, it, it, um, a few years ago, I didn't even think about any of this stuff. I just wanted to play the guitar, but you know, sometimes you just got to think about some of these things in a different perspective, and go, okay, how can I make it go to the next level? And one of the simple steps was just breaking down some of the problem areas and trying to address them and make them a little better. Um, they're not perfect. They're, I don't know that they will be. Um, like, again, that end pin idea was stupid. I loved it at first, but um, unfortunately, I had to have a, a custom cable made. And um, I, I worked with that for about six months. Um, and I did more shows without half of the pickups working than I did with them working. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, I, it was really unfortunate because I had a really big show at, um, I was headlining the tin pan in Richmond and I had just gotten my brand new custom layer of a and had, I drilled that inch hole in the back for that, that panel mount and got on stage. Sound check was roaring, was perfect. I got up there, did the first song. It was great. Went into the second song where I really used the effects and it just stopped working. <laughs> everything, everything but the Fishman uh, quit working. And I went, okay, Fishman, you guys did good. You guys <laughs> did good. Um, and, and yeah, I, I kind of, I learned what I can rely on. And, um, you know, it's nice to have a standalone pickup that will get you to the other side of the river because <laughs> yeah. when you're dead in the water it sucks it sucks real bad so um i went back instead of having them all out of one output i separated them um just because the cables can be bought a guitar center or your local music store um that's another thing to be said is being able to get your equipment if it breaks <laughs> when you're at a gig and you're on tour or somewhere, you don't want to create a situation where you don't have a fail safe. You don't have a way out. Um, oh, it's yeah. I have, <laughs> make sure I, I have a backup power supply for my pedal board. I have backup of every type of cable. 
It's, yeah, you never know what's going to happen out there. Well, and unfortunately, um, with the rig that I built, there's only certain parts that I can go, okay, I can have two of those. Because, like, the QSE Touch Mix, you know, they're not $1,500. I can't have a spare one of those just sitting around. Um, same thing with the Grace Felix. That was fifteen hundred. I think they just went up after last Nam because they're becoming so popular. So, um, the the gear itself um, can get really expensive, especially when you want certain things out of it. <laughs> Good acoustic preamps are not cheap, um, and there's only a handful of them out there that are really, really good. Um, Grace is one of the best ones in the world. Um, Grace Designs, they have the Felix, the Alex, and the Bix now, the, the smallest one. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm part of their team. I, lo I, I love their things. They're, they're roadworthy. Yeah, I don't have to worry about it. Um, and then you get to like uh, the pendulum stuff. That's that's very expensive. Like I, I have the rack mount, the SPS one, which is what James Taylor tours with, and and David Wilcox, and um, it's a three thousand dollar rack mount preamp. It's you don't travel. I don't. I wouldn't dare travel mm. with that just because I. Well, for <laughs> one, like I said earlier, Greg is retired, um, so they're no longer being made. Um, you can't get them unless you buy one from someone now. Um, so that sucks. Um, but Felix is basically the pendulum in pedal form. Now there is a new company out of Japan. Um, and I, I'll send you guys some links cause I wouldn't dare try to pronounce some of the things. Um, just, I know better, <laughs> uh, but they're, they're very similar, but they are, they're on the very expensive from like thirty five hundred to four thousand right. um, dollars, and, and again, it's it's just it's a very expensive route if you want to have good clean acoustic sound. Um, now, the, can we? I need to rewind a little bit here. Yeah, I, yeah, of course. I have. So here's my Taylor. It's Is that got, the prefix? Yes, it's the prefix plus. This is a two thousand one model. Mm -hmm. This, this is the preamp, right? Built into this yes. box here. So I don't need a separate. I mean, no. obviously this doesn't sound as good as I would like it to sound, but this, I don't need to go out and buy a preamp, correct? Or you, could it help potentially? It could help. Right. Um, okay. Because here, here's the thing is the onboard preamps only have so much tone shaping and control. Right. Um, and also power preempt power you're working uh, i believe that's a nine volt mm -hmm. right um mm -hmm. yeah so that that's that's the power source that you're working from um and if when you go to a an actual preamp that's depending on the type of power like for instance uh dustin's detar 16 volt power but it's a weird wall wart so and it's proprietary so if it goes out he's dead in the water so he doesn't use it all the time he only uses it for special shows um now the the grace has a standard like power cable you can swap it out from anything um and what that's 120 volts mm -hmm. so okay. <laughs> yeah. the the amount of power and and amping is is the difference with the fat. Um, so it you can, can get louder? No, it's just the, it's, uh, the, the presence. Yeah. It's not so much that it's louder because loud is, is a relative term. Yeah. You know, it's just like a microphone amp or a, a exactly where you can know you can get your Scarlet solo or I have the Claret or, you know, you can get a Manly or you can get, there's, there's hundreds, if not thousands of different preamps out there for mics um and and they all have their different levels too yeah, like yeah. you can you can get a simple one and it will do it it'll sound good yeah. but and until you start hearing 
the different levels and why there's just there's minute different clarity differences yeah. that you'll hear in in frequency ranges and that is something that is uh, again i know it might sound bonkers but when you a b them side by side you really will hear a difference in like a, a an upper mid-range spectrum or just a you know an 80 to 90 hertz oomph bump and you're like oh that's why that thing is so awesome because of that range because that's what it does mm -hmm. um so that's that's the thing is an onboard guitar preamp and only it's very limited in what it does um like the grace each channel has its own like uh its own impedance yeah. uh switch as well so you can be running powered pickups side by side with passive pickups that's not something that a lot of preamps have the ability to do because they're just trying to deal with either two things or e even just one yeah. so uh, there's those things that also separate the little boys from the big boys and preamps um your ability of changing each individual channel separate from the other is also you know what you pay for um low cuts things like that those those are really great for for acoustic guitar because if you have a microphone channel a lot of times you do need to have a shelf on the on that to where it just doesn't want to roar and feedback in the low end right but um your prefix i don't know i believe it's only a mono out so um, the downside yeah. to that is if you have a under saddle and mic combo, it doesn't really matter. You're only going to send out what you're able to send out. Um, but and that's blend it. I mean, I don't have that. There's it's only under saddle, but. Oh, okay. So you don't even have the mic on that one. No. Okay. I like a mic. Well, I'm asking you all these questions. So. <laughs> well, well, okay. I'm figuring then, out what I'm going to do. Well, then that's a different question. Um, if I were to look at yours and go, well, what can we add? If you just want to add a mic, um, there is actually this thing called the two mic. Um, and Trevor Gordon Hall uses it. Um, Alex Anderson, harp guitarist, mm -hmm. also uses it. It's a really feedback resistant um preempt mic and it's actually literally two mics why they call it the two mic but it, it comes on its own gooseneck that has this double mic position thing so it, it does one like at the the soundboard area and then one in front of the the bridge plate area uh and they're really feedback resistant they, it's like they got their own shelving built in so they don't they're not even listening to the lower end spectrum and that's that's something that um i think his i, th I think his name is joe mills they they have a microphone that can be added to like the k and k trinity or it's a really high-end microphone uh and it, that's essentially what they do they they put in a low shelf and already wired in to the microphone um and that would be a great solution for you. And, and that's something I'd need to go to Luthier, a Luthier and have them put that in? Or is it something um, you can put in yourself? You got some drill bits. I don't want to drill into my <laughs> Yeah, and well, and that's, 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 that is another thing is, you know, what requires a Luthier? To me, drilling an in pin hole, I don't require a Luthier. Um, I, I'm okay with, scarring it up myself if i need to um but soldering um connecting things that's that's not something i'm so good with so i rely on a luthier um rosewood guitar repair here in town we've had larry's been on the show if you want to, oh well for our listeners out there if you want to listen to larry gerwald yeah, awesome local luthier here in virginia beach yeah episode 20 i believe yeah yeah larry burwald is also a harp guitarist Burwald, um, and as a matter of fact um his harp guitar is the one that i recorded my album with ah. he, he has um a very unique ron spiller's harp guitar 
that is very beefy sounding. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's had it for many years and it, it's aged nice. And uh, I kind of A-beat it with the one that I had at the time. I had a Cedar and Koa Merrill. And um, the, the Sitka and Mahogany just had a growlier tone that I was going for. The Cedar's just a little more compressed and even. Which of, of course is great, but you know, I, I I just wanted a little more dynamic value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Larry's super super cool guy, and he's up he's up for a task. You know, um, <laughs> I've had him solder all kinds of different weird projects because this has been you know going on for a few years now that we've tried different types of K and Ks or Demarzios or undersidal transducers um it, i've tried a lot of different things um but it, it comes down to uh what do you want to be able to pay for and continue to do like you know i'd love to have a a trance system or, or things like that but those are like six hundred dollars and for just one of four or five pickups uh, that's too much so um, I, I've tried to find the, with the internal pickups, the simplest way of going about it as well. Um, even though I know it sounds crazy because there's, you know, four pickups coming out of the guitar, but <laughs> there are, there are all things that you can just go to the store and buy pretty much, um, without having to special order them. And that's yet again, something i reverted back to because yeah it's fun having custom unique proprietary things but it can it can cripple you when one stops working fair enough Hmm. yeah i just keep on going back to this thought of a phase with when you're working with multiple multiple microphones on a source that phase is going to become a really big issue and and placement of those pickups within of you know on that source uh, yeah and, and making sure that it it displays out front in the same timing and manner to where it, it creates an image because that's what you're doing is yeah. the placement of the sound out front really translates to an auditory image that people hear and uh if, if certain parts are fighting there suddenly feels like this void out front or Sometimes it's not even, you know, the whole room, it's certain parts of the room that feel lacking. And it's just in the way that frequencies respond in a room and Mm -hmm. um, phase aligning them. It's something that a lot of people don't even think about to try, Mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's a really simple thing that you can do to just suddenly bring the life back to what the instrument is supposed to be doing with where the pickups are. Um, And sometimes it's different between different guitars. Um, I mean, for instance, like my Larvae is a 12 fretter. So the sound hole pickup and the undersaddle pickup, the distance is different from my other guitars. So the phase alignment has to be slightly different as well because the sound is coming from different areas. It can't be the same exact thing. It's not the same exact thing. So that that also becomes another thing is, you know, are you having more than one guitar to plug in? Um, And that was another route to go down. I I wanted to keep the harp guitar as similar to set up possibilities as, as I could because I don't want to carry more stuff. Right. Um, I'm already at that limit of pissing TSA off and them charging <laughs> me more. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I don't have the flux and inflow of gigs that some other musicians do. So I, I do have to, to be patient and decide, okay, how do I spend the money? <laughs> so um, making it easier for myself is, is what I try to do. So I, I, the Fishman um, route just made it so great because, you know, 
I don't have to deal with several different pickups now. It's just just that one thing, and I can send it to my Felix um, and let Grace do what it does best, sound shape. Um, and pretty much the, the sound of the guitars, especially since now that the Lair Bay is a 12th fretter and my new harp guitar is a 12th fretter. <laughs> ah, you see what I did there? Yeah. The intent is, is trying to keep them as close as possible so that I don't have to overwork myself as well. Back when we had um, Dustin on, on episode, I believe it was 27, 28, um, we had also talked about something about along the lines of concerts in your home. Um, and I was wondering um, about your, do you have an agent and how do you go about doing your your gigs and how does that all go down? Um, yes and no. Okay. Uh, do I have an agent? I don't have a, a, a manager, so to, so to speak. Okay. Um, if someone asks, who's your manager? I'm going to tell them Kim Person because she, I will always rely on her word over someone's just because her extensive knowledge in this. And she's been very instrumental in leading me in the right direction. So as far as management, she would be considered, or I would consider her my manager. She doesn't book gigs though. Um, right. She right. she just more has creative direction and inspiration sort of thing, keeping me centered. Um, but as far as booking agents, uh, I've been with more music for years. And in the four years I've been with them, they've gotten me two gigs. Um, I've been with Rockstar Booking for two years. And same thing. They've gotten me two gigs. Um, they treat me like they don't know what to do with me. Okay. Because um, I, I don't sing. Um, I tell stories. And then I let the music do the talking. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I do more of a concert type setting thing. So unfortunately, it's been more spread out than um, a typical career path. I, I would love to be able to just tour and do house concerts and stuff like that. Um, at one point I did apply for concerts in your home. Mm -hmm. uh, and because I don't sing, they, they turned me down. And then Dustin Frillo had applied for us as a duo and they kind of turned us down. And then he applied solo and they accepted him. And then we just ended up doing some of his solo booked concerts in your home gigs as duo. Right. So it's it's been a an interesting process. Like I, I don't quite understand why. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I, I would love the ability to do more of those things. Um, but I'm also quite aware that it's reality. You know, um, the majority of people want to hear singing they want to hear things that they're used to to hearing in that type of setting and I, that's okay um and i understand with like concerts in your home and listening room network they want singer songwriters they don't they don't want like what i do instrumental um, type of thing yeah um that's more suited for i guess big concert solo type concert stuff and there's just such a, a big gap in that. It's, it's weird for me. Um, Cause how, how you sustainably <laughs> function in all those right. when they're so far spread out. Um, so uh, unfortunately over the years I've relied on the restaurant gigs and coffee shop gigs, but that also does devalue and hurt an image to a certain extent taking those types of gigs and you know it hurts what you are um and what people want to pay for if they see you playing there they're not going to pay high dollar to have you at their corporate event uh when they know they, they can go see you for free down down the street here yeah. versus you know no i want to go see him at an actual seated venue with the best sound possible and have an, an evening and an experience. Right. So um, 
and part of that, you know, I wanted to make sure I could bring that to people. So um, in the house concert realm, I feel like I, I've kind of moved both Dustin and I into the direction of we can provide some of the best sound possible for the listener. Um, where that's not something that a lot of the house concert people do. The people that are touring and going and playing these house concerts, a lot of times they're just bringing an amp or whatever they can get by on. And, and that's, I don't, it's not bad. It's, it's what they like to do, but I've never wanted that for myself or for the listener. I've always wanted to be able to give them the best that I could potentially give them and for them to expect that as well. Cause you know, when I went and saw Tommy in the early days, I expected him to be out there giving him every bit of himself. I mean, you'd see him in sweat, blood, tears. You knew it was the moment. And that that's that's what I got entranced with. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to feed off of. Um, because that's what hooked me was that feeling that I had um as a listener in that room. Um I know what it can do. I've seen its power. I've seen its ability to both hurt and empower and make people better in general. Um, because after they've had that experience, later that evening and the next day, they're gonna be better humans, mm. period. And that's good. That's good for their neighbors. It's good for their neighbor's neighbors. So, yeah. It's something that I, I always found, uh, like I said before, playing guitar is an output of energy. You're putting out something. So if you're exchanging energy, what's it for? And to me, if you step on that stage, that energy you should be putting out should help perpetuate the other people's next day or even their next week. Or in an instance of what Tommy and Steven and Michael Hedges and what all these people have done for fingerstyle guitarists like me, they've perpetuated a life, you know, yeah. an idea that, oh, maybe we could do that too. Maybe, maybe I could be that one on the stage giving you that feeling. Um, and that's something I, I'll always chase after is the idea that it can be done. Yeah, I think to fully kind of pull in the experience and like you've been talking about throughout the episode is this idea of kind of taking it up a level, whether it's you or Tommy or any one of these upper tier guys that are kind of taking the experience and making that bar a little bit higher and a little bit higher, whether it's, you know, through the sound and making sure that the audience is, is, you know, hearing the true sound of the guitar and all of the frequencies that it, that you know, can just penetrate you with, <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean? Like just kind of and heal you. Yeah, absolutely. Whereas, you know, a lot of these guys, like you had said, they're, you know, pulling along their little roll behinds and they just kind of plug <laughs> in and you get that direct sound and it's like, yeah, okay. And that works for you and that's great. But you know, what we're trying to do, I, you guys, what you're trying to do is just raise that bar and make it so that, you know, you can go to a theater and have a seating, you know, and and just sit there for the, the full value of of what's about to take place. And like you said, go home and after the experience and be just overwhelmed by the experience and, and kind of say, OK, the value of what of what I've just experienced is just that much better. And then that just kind of bleeds into the rest of the of the environment of the finger style guitar and hopefully well, and I, I would dare too. say i would i would dare say this word uh religious yeah um you know that a lot of times scares people um and we'll put them on edge or put them in a certain direction but to me music is my religion it is it has always been the one thing that i feel leads me in a positive direction gives me the best hope and is a language that has no bounds. Right. Um, 
it doesn't matter what culture it is or, or anything. Um, music is, is timeless and doesn't need words. Um, it, you can move people without even needing to say one thing. Yeah. Um, I have a tagline in all my emails says music is a universal language and I'd love to have a conversation with you. <laughs> precisely. Um, and you know, this came from, you know, I, I've always wanted to, to, to speak another language. Um, I went to performing arts high school and unfortunately they led me in the direction that you don't need any foreign language in high school. Ah, you don't have to take those classes. So I, I never did. Um, and I've really just, I never dissected the English language much either. Cause I was, I was putting so many music classes throughout high school that that was the language that I focused on most. And uh, unfortunately, you know, now I look at some of these monster players, like, uh, I don't even know if this is the proper way to say his name, but Sung Ha Jung, or is it Jung Sung Ha? I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but he can speak multiple languages. Um, same thing with Alexander Misko and Petri Sariola. These are all people from around the world that were brought up in cultures where they're taught multiple languages so that they can go abroad and communicate with other people. Um, but I didn't ever learn that. So to me, I've always really tried to rely on the fact that hopefully my music will reach everywhere else. And a lot of times it just, it has. And that is because of what music is. It's universal. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't discriminate. Um, it can speak to just about anybody, and that 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 goes beyond humans. Yeah. Too. Uh, I cannot tell you how many unique experiences I've had in nature, where I've been writing a song, and the animals around me will walk up and have a moment, or something in that sense happens. And I know that might sound foo foo. It's all get out. But I cannot, I've, I've had people experience it with me. Um, animals that just don't do that. They just, music has the ability to, to move more than humankind. And it doesn't have to have a human attachment like words. Yeah. It is my, truly a powerful thing. My dog sleeps on my feet while I... While <laughs> yes. <I crack. laughs> yes. Um, doesn't Good matter what warmer. style of music I'm playing. Um, I want to go back. I took Latin in high school. I think Latin should not be taught in <laughs> schools. I like I. It's I confusing. Wish, I. It's not even that. It's just like I feel like I. And I know there's some doctor kind of medical field people that'll argue against this, but who are not listening to our podcast. <laughs> not, but I feel like I was cheated. I feel like I was cheated out of learning an actual usable language. I, I wish that they had not offered Latin and not, they tell you like, Oh, Latin will help your SAT scores. And yeah, you, gonna you, help you're you learning the English basis language. Of, of all just, languages, essentially. It'll, yeah. It'll help you to learn other languages. We'll just have us learn the other languages. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't make me spend five years taking Latin and now I'm like I got what do very I do little from that. Why couldn't I have learned Spanish or something where I could go? You could have learned Spanish. Country. Why did you tell me <laughs> I learned Spanish? <laughs> well, I've since I've tried to pick it up, but I've like they really made it to a right. you know to a right. 13 year old going into high school right. or it was an eighth grade. They, they made it. it seem like it was the best thing ever. Yeah. And well, you should do this, and this is what the smart kids are doing. And really, it, is. it, it, it was actually, a big... it's, it's very important at a young age during that stage of learning because that your language center is is kind of changing and learning. And if you don't learn how to break down those communicative steps, they just don't get learned. Like at this point, I don't know that I would even try Rosetta Stone. I'd probably toss it out the window just because I. I feel like I have an idea of what I think communication is and because that's the way that my brain has formed it. But if you look at European just everywhere else in the world, really, mm -hmm. they, they teach them from such a young age, the simple dissection steps of what language is, how to communicate in those manners. And 
and actually form sentences and things like that uh, so that you can. Some languages, they, they place them in different orders. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I, I even understand. Um, I get it with music, but not not language. But I completely agree with this. I'm just saying, I think everyone should learn multiple languages. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For your own personal benefit. It's awesome to be able to go somewhere else and be able to communicate with people. But Latin should just not be <laughs> one of the languages promoted. It should be available. If you really want to take Latin, it. Yes. I think maybe it should be available. But they should not promote it in the way that they do. Well, like, and, who cares and about a lot of music theory score? has Latin root too, and that, that's unfortunate. But you don't need to take Latin in high school. To <laughs> Joe's got a that. chip on his shoulder. <laughs> yeah. I hope my Latin teacher. I love my Latin teacher, but I hope she never hears this. <laughs> that's great, Miss Yelton. Um, uh, that's great. <laughs> we actually got to go when I was in high school. I was in the Latin club because you know they. They want you to do all this stuff to get into college, like as many extracurricular activities as possible. But the one thing the Latin club did that was really cool is we went to Europe in the summer and I got to go to Switzerland and Italy. And, you know, nobody speaks Latin in Italy even, so <laughs> <laughs> still useless. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah. Uh, I, I enjoy Europe. And but they uh, they look at us funny, and I know why. I know. Unf unfortunately, uh, I I feel guilty for not being more aware and not knowing more. Um, I know that's my own fault. And so, what? Well, maybe one of these days I'll try to learn another language. Just just because of that guilt. I think the people in other like I was recently I was in Spain last year and. Spanish is probably my best out of all the foreign languages. I'm I can communicate in Spanish, not not like at a, on a poetic level, but I think that people appreciate the idea that you're trying, mm, and true. they'll even if they speak perfect English, they're just like maybe they'll respond to you in in English when they realize like you speak to them in Spanish, and they'll respond back in English, but with I think a friendlier, just they're just nicer about it because they're like, okay, you came to our country, you tried. I appreciate the effort. How the humbling is communication, that? Yeah. I'll how, speak in English. Please. How humbling is that? I cannot tell you how many times I've not had that experience here in our, our right. own country. And that, I think that's where the guilt comes from is I see the latter. I see, I see what I've seen other people do to those who are trying to speak English. And we look at them, or I, I don't, but a lot of people look at them, well, ah, why can't you speak English? They're they're speaking fairly good English. They're trying. They're yeah, trying real hard. The they're, they're doing pretty darn good. They're doing better than I would if I was trying to speak Arabic or, you know, mm -hmm. Tagalog or any yeah. <laughs> of those foreign languages. Right. So, um, yeah, it's it's humbling all the time to, to see foreigners here um, communicating with us um so it it more and more makes me want to just pick up a guitar and communicate with people and and play for them and go okay this is the one way that i do know i can talk with anybody yeah uh, and that's 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 what's always driven me to continue to do what i do no matter what i feel like i have to because it's what I'm embedded to know best. I wish people, the general public, did appreciate instrumental music more. People are just, your general person, you know, they could be a wonderful person, but they don't, the general public doesn't appreciate instrumental music. They just, there's something about someone who's a good singer, even if they've put far less time into their craft, they just happen to have a good voice kind of by luck or, They've had some some training, but you know they can strum four chords and sing. The general public seems to want that more than the guy who's put in ten thousand hours into crafting his, you know, into his craft, into his instrument. And it, it is it's very frustrating. I I feel your pain because I <laughs> I do like I get the best response playing like <laughs> the easiest song, and then I'm like I'll play the hardest thing I've ever played in my life, 
and like pull it off and i'm crickets like, yes <laughs> wow. people, i look around and people are like there's a couple couple musicians paying attention like, that was cool dude yeah yeah and you know some people people would be like sing dude i'm like come on yep uh well unfortunately it's not good to quote bill cosby but <laughs> um he did say something great one of the, the easiest to find ways to fail is to try to please everybody um and so i heard david wilcox um one time making this reference that you know music is a deep pool um and yeah you could stay in the shallows and try to get everybody and and do something that everybody will get but there's there's something really satisfying in depth going deeper because the ones that are down there in the depths that understand what you're doing you're going to catch on so much more of a deep level and an understanding that it's going to make worth waiting and not dealing with the general public that might not understand what you're doing um and that there have been several instances like that over the years that that do make it well worthwhile um so i i do i try to stay a little on the deeper realm with intent and try not to make it palatable for everybody because why it's not for everybody i understand that um but i i don't want to tell who anybody who it's for either you know <laughs> it's, i i want to leave that open so i just try to to do as best that i know and write as intensely as i know how to in the steps that i grew up learning music theory and the approach that music has the ability to move people in certain ways so i um i just stay with that go crazy with it well hey guys this has been a yeah. pleasure matt thank you so much for for joining us it's been it's been great thanks for having me on and again uh, a lot of this stuff is always changing so yeah. uh if I said anything that offended anybody, don't <laughs> worry. It might change tomorrow, man. Well, hey, um, what's your website? If yeah. you'd like to plug anything, your album, your website. Well, yeah, you yeah. know, as we said before, there's lots of Matt Thomases. So which one am I? I am themattthomas.com. And your album's uh, available on all the... All streaming platforms. platforms. It's called Man on the Moon. That's right. It's a dedication to Stephen Bennett. Right. Cool. Well, uh, you guys have a great one. Thanks, and, guys, uh, for having me on. And yeah. Hope to see you guys out and about at shows. We'll be in touch. All, All right. right, man. See you guys. Have a good day, Aaron. Yeah.